on the face of it, it, it's, it could be like any other project up and down the country where police are sharing with local authorities or fire are sharing with someone else. What's different about this project? The difference with this project is it's not just a co-location. And I did point out where we do co-locate with other organisations. You have to take into account the nature of Northumberland and the communities of Northumberland and the fact we're talking about retained stations that by the very nature of who staffs them, as you've seen with my colleague here, they are the community. So when you're delivering services, it's to the families, friends, relatives, the people who, who are in the, in the hall, in the pub with those people on a Saturday night that shows how the investment by the authority is not only paying off in the protection in, say, in pure fire and rescue terms, but paying off in the protection, development, education and growth of the whole community, particularly through children. And that is where the, that's the payoff. That is where you get perhaps the bang for your buck that you don't just get through the co-location where you may choose an ambulance service to occupy bay one and I have a fire engine in bay two. This is about getting to the heart of the problems in with vulnerable people and using the intelligence in the community to address those problems. Uh, Dave gave a very relevant and recent example about using community intelligence about that individual who had an injury to enact a proper result. We've had, we've had situations in the last three days where our crews in Rothbury have been delivering baby milk. They've been delivering district nurses because the district nurses couldn't get to vulnerable people through the snow. We've been, this is real, and the network of intelligence doesn't just come from adult social care who may have a list of elderly vulnerable people. It comes from the fact that Dave and his colleagues, they have, they have the local intelligence to use the facts of, they know the families and people in the communities, and then the people in the community know who to turn to. Because often, particularly people on the edges of society, might not necessarily ring the police or even the fire service direct, but they will certainly talk to Dave and his colleagues, and that's how you get that locality to address the problems in the community. You have to say one thing about the partnership working. Uh, what would be the, the most significant benefit, apart from the bricks and mortar, what would be the, the most partnership benefit from you both work, children's services and, and the fire service working together? Uh, there are a significant number of uh, children and families who have not had fires, have not had injuries, have not had obesity, have not had... Um, educational disjoint issues, have not had problems with car seats, have not had road traffic accidents, have not had impacts through hazard that we have reduced those risks and we are making sure, particularly with the, young, the younger children, they're in good shape now, going through education and have benefited from that extra level of protection we've given them. In, in the application you talk about one of the drivers behind this is about creating a more diverse workforce. Yeah. How has that played out? Um, well, if I can give some examples, the, you'll be aware the Foreign Rescue Services, um, to be frank, lag behind much many other parts of local government about recruitment, particularly of women and ethnic minorities. We have tried for many years to address this to, uh, I wouldn't say to a great level of success across the whole country, but it's been a mixed, mixed picture. What we have seen uh, recently is we've been set stretched targets by government and very much I think that's helped refocus again fire and rescue services specifically on recruitment. What our programme has done, which uh, this is part of a larger programme for fire and rescue and community safety of refurbishing and re-equipping our sites, is made sure we've had the facilities to make sure our, our stations particularly are uh, clearly accessible to all parts of the community. We talked about DDA, which could also apply with our staff, maybe not always firefighting staff, but even that's not an issue because we now have uh, registered disabled staff who serve as firefighters, but also particularly where we've had underrepresentation by women in the fire service. Can I check, you mentioned that firefighters now know more about safeguarding. Yes. Does that mean your firefighters have all been CRB checked and have you all had safeguarding training and if so, from whom? Well, um, we're going, we're currently, we've CRB the firefighters who actually proactively work on the fire stations. We're currently CRBing all of them. That's our, our grand plan, but actually that's quite a lot of firefighters. Yes. Yeah. Um, they are not all currently CRB, no. but the majority, we're now into the majority rather than the minority. Yeah. We are working through a programme. The safeguarding <laughs> um, is, is a mixture of, of um, 
offered training, but it is more about daily conversations around issues um, where we are using the local firefighters not to spy, but to bring local intelligence back and to be that good neighbour. So they are more knowledgeable now. If they attend a fire and they notice an issue, they're more able to say to the family, I know somebody who perhaps could give you a bit of support around this. And they're quite often the people who act as the brokers for us.